Welcome to Ozark First Assembly. We're so glad you joined us today as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. If this is your first time, we're so glad you've chosen to join us. Be sure to stop by the Welcome Center after service to pick up a small gift as we're saying thank you for being with us today. Registration for Kids Camp is available on the Church Center app. If you have any questions, please see Pastor Matt. Fervent Women's Ministry will be selling sheet sets all the way through April 23rd. This will help fund our Widow's Luncheon in June, as well as help with our missions pledge and help us continue to help those in need in our community. You may purchase at the table, in the foyer, or see one of our Women's Ministry team members. Join us on April 23rd as we host the Walner Family Foreign Missionaries for our morning service. There will be a youth camp informational meeting next Sunday in the fellowship hall immediately following morning service. See Pastor Scotty or Melissa for details. There will be a ladies night out paint party Thursday, April 27th here at the church at 6 p.m. The cost is $30. Visit the Welcome Center to sign up and choose the design that you'd like to paint. Sign up by this Wednesday, April 12th. Please see Julie Watley with any questions. There will be no service tonight to allow you to spend time with your families and celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Be sure to check us out on Facebook or the Church Center app for more announcements and to stay better connected. Again, thanks so much for being with us today. We're expecting a great service. Good morning. As we celebrate Easter this morning, um, I wrote a story as we get prepared to go into worship to a day. Have you heard the story of the lion that acted as if he was a lamb? The lion was a creature brave and strong. He protected his people from evils and dangers. On one night, he made his way to do just that. But this time, it was different from all the others. The path was dark as he walked. Not a sound was heard off of his steps. The pads of his paws made sure of that. With every step, his heavy heart ached. He knew everything that was coming as fear tried to pull him back. But determination pushed him forward and forward he stepped. Normally, a lamb is called for these moments, but he chose to go instead. The lamb was used as a covering, a washing of all transgressions. And though it was true, a covering and a washing of was asked for, an ancient enemy of was taking hold of the right of his people's own lives for an ancient transgression. So this was now a matter of protection. Only he could walk this path now. And as he topped the, the peak of a small hill and he began to walk down, the forest path began to a thin as an opening appeared. There a light shone and his heart raced even more. The time had come for the protection and the sacrifice. As the forest ended and the field began, he looked and he saw his enemy, beautiful and evil at the sight, surrounded by evils of with the worst intentions. There he is, they screamed, fighting the urge to a turn around. He walked on knowing this was the only way. As he walked to, to the center of the the horde, surrounded of by pe people that, that he had defeated b before. Slowly they began to, to encircle him even more, but nervous of with each step, for they knew of if he wished his paws of might of would swipe, swipe each and every life out of them. A one, a one brave creature nipped a mac at a, 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 a paw, but he tr trembled back as instinct turned his head to a see everything there. Enough! His enemy cr cried, silencing the, the crowd. He has kept his word and came tonight. So let's do what we have come to a do. And like a flash, cords appeared, wrapping his feet and binding around his neck. And each of them pulled at those cords, drawing him to the, the ground. And with a thud, his body fell as all of them cheered up with happiness. Bring him to the altar, 
his enemy said. And so the strongest of them began to, to, to a pull and tug at those cords as his body dragged across the ground. As he passed each evil, they spit and jeered and kicked at him, knowing this was the first and only time any of them would have a shot at him. As dirt and bruises began to cover his body, he stopped for just a second as he came to the stone altar. His hair and skin began to to appeal as they pulled him up and over to to the top of the, the, the altar. A hand began t- to a play of with his mane as his body came t- to a halt. Peeking up, he saw a w- 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 wicked, vile smile, and he heard the words, I think he deserves a shave. Of with the blood c- curdling scream of from those around him, he shut his eyes as his neck and head began to to be a pull to and fro for all of his enemies, not thinking of pulling out any knife, began to pluck his mane. And instead of a roar that could stop the entire mass, he made no sound but welcomed each hand on his head as if it were just a friend's. And with a smack, his head hit the stone as the final tug let go. A hand began to rub up and down his neck as if he was just a pet, mocking this majestic beast. And with a sigh longing for comfort, he began to purr as tears swelled in his eyes. You fool, a voice whispered in his ear. Did you really think you could bring the covering a lamb could bring? Not only will I kill your people's precious protector, but I will still lay claim to what is mine. For when could a lion do what a lamb was made to do? Closing his eyes, embracing for everything of that came next. His heart pounding of as if it were a drum. The enemy raised its knife and with a guttural yell screamed, now die! As the knife sucked into the lion's heart, his body tightened in pain and slowly began to drop as the life began to pour out of out like the blood on the altar began to a drain. A roar arose of through that camp as the evil saw that 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 they had won. Celebrations and cheering, dancing began to arise as his enemy stood over the, the altar and cried, The lion is dead! As the celebrations continued throughout that night and as the first signs of dawn began to appear, the wicked evil army wanted to get one last look at the lifeless lion on the altar they had all once feared. But what they saw, they did not expect. For as the first light of dawn began to touch the altar, the features of the lion began to alter. The sun first touching his tail, turning that dirty, matted fur into perfectly hair. The farther up it moved, the more he began to be pure. As the ropes were hit by sunlight, they began to sizzle and fade away until he laid there with nothing on him. In fear, his enemies began to slowly move forward, trying to see if it could be true. And as the line of light began to touch his neck and head, his crown of mane began to, to grow back. Panic began to fill the camp. But it wasn't until his chest began to rise up and down that they screamed in fright. Suddenly, his eyes burst open, and in the blink of an eye, he jumped to his feet, standing on top of that that altar, and he gave a victorious roar, sending his enemies of in a panic, hitting each other as they ran in fright. And as he leaned back as if an arrow tightened upon a bow, he launched off of his perch, landing on his enemy, giving him one more victorious roar. Face whitened up with fear. How? he asked. 
And with strength in his voice, he said, you may have known the rules, but you forgot one thing. Any protector willing to sacrifice themselves would cover any transgression. And with his paw on his enemy's chest, he began to press down just like a lamb. That means your hold, your claim is through. And with that, he pressed down even harder as his enemy screamed in pain and with a pop turned to ash, defeated, gone. And as the sun ended its arising, the lion stood in the field, victorious over his enemy, his people protected, defended, covered from any and all transgressions. And that is the story of the lion that acted as if he were a lamb. I'm going to ask all of us, uh, let's stand and let's prepare for a worship this morning. Jesus, we thank you of that you are our risen king. You are alive. You are not just a God of that all of us serve, but you are alive. You were a lion of that protected us, and you were the lamb of who gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And three days after that, Jesus, you came back again because you are our victorious sacrificial lamb and the lion of who protects us and who watches over us. And so, Jesus, this morning, I pray of that our praise would not just be a song, but God, it would be a song of thanksgiving. It would be a praise of that says, Jesus, Jesus, we thank you for what you have done in our lives. So, Jesus, we worship you and we honor you this morning. John 3, 16. Probably don't even have to open your Bibles or pull up the Bible app or anything. John 3, 16, you know those words probably so well. That say to us, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. Father, we come today, Lord, to celebrate you. Lord, as we gather together here in this place in your name, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move. As you have already moved, we pray that you would continue to move to open our hearts to the reality of Christ to open our ears to the reality of the gospel, to open our eyes to see the reality of our Savior. Lord, that your will may be done through your Son today by the working of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John three sixteen, and even the two verses that we've read this morning, perhaps the most well-known verses in the entirety of the Word of God, of And we find within these verses, especially in verse 16, some important truths. And that is, first, God loves the world He created. And the measurables of His love is able to reach everyone. And not only is it true that God loves the world He created, but what is also true from these verses is that God sent His Son not to condemn the world, but to save the world in Him through belief. There are individuals in society that have been, that are, and possibly will yet be That they view the gospel message, they view Christianity as condemnation. But the word of God, his word that was given through his son was not to condemn, but to save. God's love was not just sentimental. Just a feeling. God's love moved him to action. 
And this leads us to a foundational point of our faith in Christ, in Jesus as our Savior. And that is this truth, this foundational truth. God loves us because He wants to. God loves us because He wants to. God doesn't love us because we're good enough. He doesn't love us because we're perfect and somehow we are worthy. God loves us because He wants to. Now we, I, you, have the ability to reject His love. To say to Him, I don't want nor do I need your love. But even if we, if I, if you, if we reject His love while we still draw breath here on this earth, the offer of His love still stands. Why? Because God has chosen to love us. Again, when we look at John 3.16... We need to emphasize that what is being spoken here by John the Apostle is not just mere sentiment. John 3.16, it's God's word of affirmation to his most intimate creation, and that is us. It's mankind. We are God's most intimate creation. The Godhead, God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit said, let us make man, humankind, in our own image. It is the only thing of God's creation. We are the only thing of God's creation that bears His image. And John 3.16 is not just a word. It's not a word of sentiment of just something that is just felt, and that's it. An emotion that is fleeting. John 3.16 is God's word of affirmation to us, the individuals who bear His image. And if we look up that word affirmation, what we find is that the meaning of affirmation is to state in a positive manner. It means to assert as valid or confirmed. It means to express dedication to. And that's what God did on the cross through His Son. He expressed His love in a positive manner. He asserted what was validated and what is confirmed is that He loves those who bear His image, mankind. And through the cross, through His word of affirmation, He has expressed His dedication to us. By this definition of the word affirmation, We understand that at some point in time, unlike just a sentiment, unlike just a feeling that we might have, affirmation at some point in time is going to take action. It's going to take action. And this is why we can say with conviction that God's love is more than mere sentiment. God's love took action through sending His Son, through Jesus coming to this earth that He created. God's love took action in that. And the purpose of the Father sending the Son was to bring salvation. Salvation, not condemnation. In fact, The very last song that we sung this morning, His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the translation of a Greek, an English translation of a Greek word or name that means Savior. Matthew 1, 21, when Gabriel appeared to Joseph and to Mary and talking about the coming of Jesus Matthew 1, 21, Gabriel says, She will give birth to a son, and you shall, you will. God had already named his son, the Messiah, the promised one. God had given him a name with purpose to show his affirmation. He says, you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In fact, when we study the Word of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the idea of redemption in both Testaments, God's Word, is the payment of a price to ransom those who are held captive. 
And the price was paid on the cross. It was paid on the cross by God's Son, by Jesus, our Savior. God gave His Son, His one and only Son, as a substitute for our sinfulness. We know the Word of God, the gospel message is this, that Jesus would die in our place, that Jesus would bear our sins. In fact, Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 22. In the New Living Translation, Paul writes, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Everyone, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And when Paul says here that we have all sinned and we've all fallen short, it means all. All, everyone. There's no exception. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how good we are by other people's testimony or estimation. We are not good enough. And when the standard is God's glory that we find in verse 25 there in Romans 3, when the standard is God's glory and the standard is God's righteousness, it makes no difference if we miss by an inch or if we miss by a mile. We miss. In fact, to put it in layman's terms, if you will, if Scotty and I were going on a trip and we were going to the Atlanta airport, if Scotty got there before me and missed the flight by five minutes, okay, he's missed the flight by five minutes, and I'm running extremely behind. I missed the flight by an hour, okay? I'm an hour late. In the grand grand scheme of things, what difference did it really make? Because what happened? We both missed the flight, right? Scotty missed it by just a little bit. I missed it by a whole bunch, but we both missed the flight. And that's what Paul is getting at here. It doesn't matter if we miss God's standard by an inch or by a mile. We all miss his standard of righteousness. And when we think about it, it doesn't matter if I feel that I'm better than my neighbor. My neighbor is not my standard. My neighbor is not the standard. God is the standard. He is the standard and we all fall short of his standard. And notice what Paul writes in verse 24. In the New American Standard, it reads, Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Justified. That's what Paul says. Justified in Christ. The cross is the answer to the problem that all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. The cross is the answer. Justification, we understand when we study God's Word, it is a legal concept. It is a legal term. So what Paul is saying here, in essence, is that we are justified, meaning that in God's courtroom, He has pronounced us innocent of all charges in Christ. In fact, I love the way the living Bible really brings this out In verse 24 of Romans 3, this is how the Living Bible brings this verse out in this concept of being justified in God's courtroom. Yet now God declares us, God declares us not guilty. Not guilty of offending Him if we trust in Jesus Christ who in His kindness freely takes away our sins. God says you're not guilty. In fact, a story I was listening to, Robert Morris, Pastor's Gateway Church. And if you know in Texas and really in that area, it's a, a great work of the Lord. 
And he was talking about that in devotion. He was reading this in the Living Translation. And in verse 24, he came across that as he was reading the fact that yet now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ. And he said, as he was sitting there and contemplating that just in his mind, that he said to himself, I know what the Scripture says, God, but, but you, as he is dealing, he said, with his past and who he once was. But you and I both know that I'm guilty. That's not true. And he said the Lord arrested him. In fact, the term, you can go and listen to it on podcast, in his message, he said right there, he says, I angered the Lord. That's his words. I angered the Lord. Because God says, I have said, I have justified you in Christ. And I am not a liar. What I speak is truth. My nature is truth. And if I say in my son, if you put your faith in him, you're justified, you're justified. He's pronounced us not guilty. The action that took place on the cross was God placing our sins on his son. I know we've thought about this. I believe that we've thought about this, but have we really contemplated lately or in a fresh and new sense what the cross means? The cross was God placing our sin on Christ. And we don't need to just run past that and just say, thank you, Lord, I'm so appreciative. We need to stop. And we need to dwell there. Because the Lord took all of my sin. He took all of your sin. He took all of everyone's sin. And he placed it on his son. And through pronouncing us not guilty, he said to his son, to God, you are guilty. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. Is God declared His Son guilty and Jesus died in our place. So I could not be, so you could not be guilty. Jesus through the cross releases us from spiritual bondage through the pain of a price. One that was so high for us to pay. And not only was it so high for us to pay, but it was gaining interest day by day. It was a debt that literally overwhelmed us that we could never get out from under. But in Jesus, in Jesus, we're pronounced not guilty. If we are in Christ Jesus, we have been released from spiritual bondage. Because now, in Him... Our identity is no longer found in ourselves or anything else. And that's where the power of Christianity or so-called Christianity loses any value. Because there is a form of Christianity today and has been around for quite some time since the beginning of the gospel that you can keep your sin and carry Christ as well. It's not biblical. It's not biblical. That's not why Jesus died. Jesus didn't die on the cross so I could stay the way I am. Jesus died on the cross so I could be made into a new creation and understand what it means to live life to the full the way God intended and created us in the very beginning. In Christ means that he has released us. We are pronounced not guilty because now our identity And I know that the youth right now, that Scotty and Melissa have started a series on that about identity. And we find that being just literally torn apart by the enemy in our society today. People don't know who they are. He is the author, I'm talking about the devil, of confusion. He is a liar. That's the only thing that he speaks. And he loves to bring confusion. But in Christ, our identity is no longer found in ourselves or in anything else. Our identity is found in Christ. 
And through belief, I lose myself to gain Christ, to gain the not guilty verdict. Mark 8, 34, Jesus says, if, you, if anyone wants to come after me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, if anyone wants to find this not guilty verdict and walk in that reality, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, identify with me, find your identity in me, and follow after me. Because a necessary part of discipleship, of being in Christ, is a daily willingness to sacrifice all. God never asks of us what He has not already done. God gave His all so we could be not guilty. And all He says is, give back what I have already given. Everything. Discipleship is daily a daily willingness to sacrifice all and even suffer for the sake of Christ as He did for us as we take up our cross. And we die to self. Or as Paul puts it in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. That's our identity. That's our identity now in Christ. That's our identity in this not guilty verdict from the Lord. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in this fleshly dwelling. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. Loved me. By action. And gave himself up for me. So now if we are in Christ Christ Jesus, he is our identity. We are walking in that not guilty verdict from the Father. We are in Christ. Now God looks at us and he doesn't see sin. Because he's removed it. He's removed it. We don't live there anymore. It's not our residence. We don't play there anymore. We're in Christ now. So when the Father looks at us, He sees His Son and He pronounces us not guilty. And God does it legally and He does it justly in pronouncing us not guilty. Why? Because He took our sins and He pronounced His Son guilty in our stead. Jesus took our iniquity to the cross and he paid the price that we could never pay. The once and for all price for our redemption was paid on the cross. So don't you believe the lie that the enemy would tell you you're not good enough. Because you know what? You're not. But in Christ we are. In him we are. Because what does Jesus do? I love what I heard Dick Foth, Dr. Dick Foth say about the cross. He said, Jesus destroys the evidence of our sin on the cross. Destroys the evidence. There's no evidence. So when the enemy comes as the accuser that he is, and we're in Christ, and he points his finger at us, and don't you tell me he doesn't because he does it to me. Doesn't he come to you when you're getting into that prayer closet and you're trying to pray and you're trying to get into the Word and there's different things that are pressing on you? The enemy's bringing accusation after accusation. But in Christ, in the courtroom of heaven, the prosecutor who is our accuser, the devil, comes and he presents his case and the verdict is not guilty. Because all their sins have been washed away. All the evidence of their sin is gone. It cannot be found. Therefore, in my son, they're not guilty. God loved us the way that we needed to be loved. You know, as kids living in a home, in our home, sometimes we have a picture of how we want to be loved, right? I want this new toy. I want this certain bedroom suit. I don't know. You just put whatever defining there, the way I want to be loved. But you know what I found with my parents? Yes, they're imperfect, but they, as my parents, they loved me the way that I needed to be loved. And I talk about discipline with my dad, but you know what? I found out now as an adult, my dad loved me the way that I needed to be loved. When he disciplined me. God loved us the way we needed to be loved. For God so loved the world. He gave his son. And Paul said it this way. That when the world thinks about 
God's love and the way that he loved us, the way that we needed to be loved, they look at it differently. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And then skip to verse 23, but we preach, Paul says, Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. And to the Gentiles, foolishness. Stumbling block refers to weakness. Verse 24, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. In other words, the very weakness and foolishness in human eyes open the door for the power of God to be at work in our lives. The world sees the cross and what Jesus did and what we proclaim as the gospel message as weak and foolish. It makes no sense, but the, what was seen by the world as weak and foolish absolutely opened the door of the power of God in our lives. God loved us in the way that we needed to be loved. He loved us through the cross. He loved us through the cross. The cross was a place of brutality. When you just study the history of the cross, there's different aspects of the cross depending on what culture used the cross. There were individuals who were impelled on the cross. And if you want to know what impelled mean when you leave the service today, you can Google it. There was others like the Romans that would hang people on the cross. And it was reserved for slaves and not for citizens because the cross was to set an example of Rome's power and their authority. Everything that we study about the cross, we understand the suffering physically that Jesus went through. But he did it because it was the way that we needed to be loved. We all have a history, do we not? All of us have a history. We have a history that shapes our life. And in with that concept of history is, I just bring things to a close this morning. John speaks of Peter's first encounter with Jesus in John 14 too. And Jesus spoke this the first time that he saw Peter. He says, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. That, that's your history. That's who you are right now. You're Simon, the son of John. That, that's your history. But Jesus says, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And the name that Jesus gives to Simon, we understand when we dig into that name, Peter means rock. And as we read the gospel accounts, we find that Peter was anything but a rock. He was a person who was driven by impulse. He was the, the mere picture of anything but firm and steady. And the gospel accounts are, are full of examples to show his impulsive nature and that he was anything but firm and steady. And yet throughout this time, that Jesus comes to a point and asks his disciples point blankly before the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was shown to Peter, James, and John who he really was, his nature, he asked them point blankly, or in a, in a point blank way, he says, this is what everyone says about me, but what do you say? And Peter spoke up and said, what? You are the son of the living God. The one who has come. And in that and out of that context, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus once again affirms what he spoke in John 1, 42. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. 
And before anybody thinks that I'm just blasting the Apostle Peter, let me say that I believe that in some way all of us can identify with Peter, can we not? In fact, hell wants us to believe that we can never be anything more than we already are in the flesh as the musicians come back. The enemy of our soul, the accuser of the brethren, wants us to believe lies, but Jesus wants us to believe his word of affirmation. Jesus saw Simon not as he was, but as he would ultimately become in him through the power of Holy Spirit. Going back to Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son and you shall name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Again, Jesus is the translation, is the English translation of a Greek word that means Savior. And this Greek word that is translated for us in the New Testament as Jesus It's the translation of the Hebrew name, Yeshua. That's Jesus' name, Yeshua. In fact, from what I understand and just digging in history, it wasn't to somewhere around the 16th or 17th century that actually the name Jesus was used. Before then, it was Yeshua. And Yeshua, the Hebrew name, it means God is salvation. God is salvation. And this English translation of that name Yeshua is Joshua. Joshua. In fact, we find the name Joshua throughout the Old Testament, do we not? But there were two prominent Joshuas in the Old Testament. Two prominent Joshua's, the name that God chose to give his son. You will call him Yeshua. Yeshua, God is salvation, Savior. The first is the captain of Israel who led them into the promised land, right? Joshua, who was the servant of Moses that God groomed to take the people into the promised land. The other is in Zechariah. Maybe he's not as familiar to us, but he is too of the prominent Joshua's in the Old Testament. And in Zechariah, this Joshua is the high priest. He is the high priest who would lead the children of Israel back into the promised land. The first led them into the promised land, and the second prominent Joshua would lead them back into the promised land after 70 years in captivity in Babylon. Why? Because they'd sinned. They had rebelled against the Lord. Now, the reason that I would even bring this up is because these two Joshuas point to our Savior. They, appoint, they, they literally point to the amazing nature of our Savior. Because Jesus, Yeshua, leads us into the promise of God. Salvation. Through His death and His resurrection. And we understand the death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection were not two events. They're one event for salvation. That God can pronounce us in Christ not guilty. Yeshua leads us into the promises of God. But not only that, our Savior, in talking about Joshua, the second Joshua and Zechariah, who led the people of God back into the promised land after they had sinned. What is the significance of that? How does it show the nature of our amazing Savior? It's this way. Our Savior is able to lead us back even when we mess up. Even when we've blown it and we've messed up, He's able to bring us back home and save us as Hebrews 7 says to the uttermost completely and fully Yeshua 
Yeshua. Father, Lord, even as we come now before you, Lord, your word has been spoken. Lord, not just through me, but through Scotty. And the spoken word through the worship. Lord, your word has been spoken and declared. And Lord, I pray that our hearts are stirred and drawn to you today. Are you here this morning? And you need his love. God wants to love you the way that you need to be loved. Whether he is calling you home for the very first time to pronounce you not guilty. Or maybe you have made a mess of things as we all have done. You have made a mess of things. And you just say, there's just no hope. There's just no hope. I just keep making a mess of things. I just, I keep tripping over these things. God, I see it working for others, but it just doesn't work for me. Lord, I have just got to live in my history. That's a lie. That's a lie. He'll change your history. He'll remake you as he remade Simon to Peter. Are you here this morning? And you need God to love you in the way that he has spoken in his word. Would you get up from where you are? Would you come to this front and allow him to do that right now? Come on, just right now where you are, would you stand up? Would you just stand up and would you come to him? Not to me, not to, to my call, but come to the Lord and say, Lord, I believe in you. I'm not believing the lie of the enemy. Lord, love me the way that I need to be loved. Love me the way, God. Lord, that you say you love me, that you love me so much that you gave your son for me. Lord, change my history today. Would you come and let him change your history today?